welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a Q&A session. Please save all questions for that time. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Your host of today's call is Ms. Michelle Bichard. Thank you. You may begin. Thanks, Keandra. My name is Michelle Bichard again, and I am with um, Department of Health and Human Services in, with SAMHSA. Also with me today is Krista Schaefer, who is representing the Department of Education, and Janet Shamcone, who represents the Department of Justice. This webinar will provide you with a brief overview of three complementary grant programs. Those are SAMHSA's Project Aware for Local Education Agencies, the Department of Education School Climate Transformation Program, which is also for local education agencies, and the Department of Justice's School Justice Collaboration Program, which is called Keeping Kids in School and Out of Court Program. During this webinar, there will be three opportunities for you to ask any questions you might have. And a copy of this webinar, webinar, webinar can be made available to you and we'll give you instructions on how to access the webinar at the end. In early 2013, President Obama released his Now is the Time plan. This was issued following the December 2012 Newtown, Connecticut school shooting. As President Obama said after this tragedy, we won't be able to stop every violent act, but if there is one thing we can do to prevent any of these events, we have a deep obligation, all of us, to try. Two components of the Now is the Time plan were to make schools safer and to increase access to mental health services. While the Department of Justice program is not technically a part of Now is the Time, the Now is the Time plan, it does complement the two SAMHSA and ED programs. On the next two slides, you will see a table that summarizes these three funding opportunities. The eligible applicant for both the SAMHSA Project AWARE and the Ed School Climate Transformation Program are local education agencies or consortia of local education agencies. The definition of a consortia of LEAs can be found in Section 9101, Subsection 26 of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Justice's program, Keeping Kids in School and Out of Court, has the eligible applicant as the as local juvenile justice family court that can demonstrate a partnership with the Ed School Climate Transformation and SAMHSA Project AWARE programs. For SAMHSA's Project AWARE, applicants can request up to $50,000 per year for two years, and we expect to make up to 100 awards. For the Ed School Climate Transformation Program, the average award amount will be $200,000 per year, but the award amount could range from $200,000 to $750,000 per year. The project period for the Ed Grant is up to five years, and they expect to make up to 118 awards. Lastly, Justice is Keeping Kids in School and Out of Court Program will award up to $600,000 for the entire project period of three years. They expect to make up to five awards, which includes one two-year training and technical assistance award. So now I'll take some time to provide a brief overview of SAMHSA's Project AWARE program for local education agencies. The AWARE of Project AWARE is an acronym that, acronym that stands for Advancing Wellness and Resilience in Education. The purpose of the LEA AWARE program is twofold. The first intent is to train school personnel and other adults who, who and other adults to detect and respond to behavioral health issues in school-aged youth. The second intent is to increase the overall awareness and capacity of communities to respond to mental health issues that are presented by children and youth. Through Project AWARE for LEAs, it is expected that there will be increased awareness of mental health issues among children and youth and that outreach and engagement strategies will be used to increase awareness of and promote the positive mental health of school-aged children and their families. It is also expected that the mental health literacy of youth-serving adults will increase via the use of mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid training and to the overall capacity of communities to respond appropriately to behavioral health issues um, impacting school-aged youth will increase. The program requirements are summarized on the next two slides. First, that the applicant will train at least six mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid instructors who will then train at least 250 adults to become what we call mental health first aiders. And I, I will 
add at the very end, there's, there's been several questions I've gotten from communities about the, the 250 number, so I'll talk about that at the very end. Second, the applicant needs to establish a partnership between at least the local mental health authority and law enforcement agency. The applicant will need to include with the application a letter of commitment from each of these two organizations. You are not required but are encouraged to consider including other partners such as emergency first responders and family serving organizations. If you identify additional partners, however, you will need to include letters of commitment from them also. You will also be expected to develop a plan to sustain this project when federal funding ends, to collect data to measure and assess performance, and attend virtual meetings and webinars since we do not plan to have any in-person meetings for this program. As was mentioned earlier, eligible applicants are local education agencies or a consortia of LEAs, and the applicant must also apply for the Ed School Climate Transformation Grant for LEAs. You are encouraged but not required to apply for the justice funding. I wanted to spend a, a minute or so talking about mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid. Mental health first aid was originated in Australia in 2001. It is a public education program that introduces adults to the risk factors and warning signs of adult mental health issues as well as the importance of intervening early. Mental health first aid's eight-hour training helps participants understand how to offer initial help in a mental health or substance use crisis with the ultimate goal of connecting persons to appropriate professional peer and self-help care. There are both English and Spanish versions of mental health first aid. In contrast, youth mental health first aid is designed to teach adults who interact with youth how to help an adolescent, that is someone between the ages of 12 to 18, who is experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis. Topics covered under youth mental health first aid include anxiety, depression, disruptive behavior disorders such as ADHD, and eating disorders. Just want to point out that you can find more detailed information about both mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid in Appendix H of the AWARE RFA. Appendix H also includes links to um, uh, uh, more extensive information about both programs. As part of the Project AWARE application, you will need to include the letters of commitment we talked about earlier a mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid training and implementation plans, and describe how you plan to build capacity and leadership to sustain mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid when federal funding ends, and also describe how you will collect and report data. Your application should be divided into five sections, each of which responds to the five areas your application will be reviewed on. Section C, which is proposed implementation approach, is worth the most points at 35 followed by your proposed approach to, uh, to training at 30 points. Staff and organizational experience is worth a maximum of 15 points, while the descriptions of your need and targeted population, as well as your data collection and performance measurement efforts are worth a maximum of 10 points. The budget is not a scored criterion, but it will, but it will be reviewed for its appropriateness. If you have any questions regarding this particular RFA, you should send them to this email address, so it's lea underscore aware at samhsa.hhs.gov. And usually we're able to respond to those questions within less than 24 hours. Okay, well, I'm going to open it up to any questions um, that the participants might have about Project AWARE for local education agencies. All right, to ask a question, please press star 1 and when prompted, provide your first and last name, as well as your location, city, and state. That's star one, and when prompted, give your first and last name, as well as your location. While in the queue, if you decide to withdraw your question, please press star two. One moment, please, for your first question. Andrea, we'll give this another minute, um, and if there are no questions, we'll move on. 
Okay, um, we do have um, five calls in queue at this time. Okay. Um, our first question is from Diane Tremblay from Hayward, Wisconsin. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Thank you. Um, thank you for having this webinar. The first question that I have is, is it, it, am I clear on the fact that we do need to apply as a school district to Project AWARE and the Climate Grant both? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then most of the funds, I'm assuming, for Project AWARE go toward the training of those 60 um, trainings? The funding for Project Aware would go to train the, the minimum of six instructors. Oh, six! I, I misheard yeah. you. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. I was just, I was okay. Yeah, you don't have enough money to train six. Instructors. No, that's that was my question. That yeah, makes yeah. perfect sense. You should have enough to train six. <laughs> okay, and you supply that training on your website. I assume that we can see where that is located at. No, I would suggest that you, again, you look at the links in Appendix H, which will link you to the National Council on Behavioral Health. Um, there are three organizations that can provide the instructor training. It is the National Council, as well as the Maryland Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, as well as the Missouri Department of Health. And Got it. In some preliminary conversations I've had with them, they will be looking to see where these 100 awards will be made and they will try to allocate their resources to the extent that they can within the areas where there might be groupings of um, grantees so you would not have to travel as far for the training. Excellent. And Appendix F is in the application materials? Right. Appendix H is in Harry. H. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question is from Nancy Kirsch from Flint, Michigan. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Okay, so the six instructors that we um, are training, are they required to be newly trained or can we use the existing instructors from our partner CMH? We would like you to newly train six people. This is to, to expand. If you've got current efforts going on, we'd like to see that expanded. Okay, so it's required that they be newly trained. Yes. Okay, and could we train three instructors the first year and three in the second? And, and the thinking behind that is what we would do is train the first three instructors in, you know, the five-day youth training and then have them take the two-and-a-half adult and then in the second year do the same with three different instructors? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, and what's the start date um, of the grant? What, when would we be ex expected to start? We're hoping that the awards will be made by September 15th. Um, okay. We have to award the funds by September 30th because that's the last day of our fiscal year. So right now the anticipated date is September 15th, but I wouldn't be surprised if we get closer to September 30th. Um, the expectation is, that if I remember from the RFA, that um, your instructors are trained within the first four months of the four months or less of the grant and that not later than the fourth month of the first year would you begin to train um, those adults in mental health first aid so they could become mental health first aiders. Okay, okay. One, one final question. Um, so do the LEAs in the SEA grant, are, are, do they have to be applicants of the local LEA grant in order to be part of the state, or how, how would those LEAs be chosen in the state grant? It's up to the state to determine how they're going to choose the LEAs they're going to work with. Okay. I, what I thought your question was going to be is if an LEA is selected by the state, yes. they have to apply for, for this opportunity. And the answer is they can. Got it. But they also, if they apply for this and they're included in the state, I believe it's in the expectation section of the RFA, it says that they must describe in the application, should they receive funding from both, how these funds for the, for the Project AWARE LEA will expand or enhance upon what they're going to be doing with the state. Got it. Thank you. So, but it's in, the, it's in the expectation section at the very beginning of the RFA. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. We have four more callers in the queue. Um, our next question is from Sharon Bearden from Quincy, Illinois. Your line is open. You may I ask a question? Hi. Um, I have two questions, actually, but they're pretty simple. The first one is we have to apply for the school climate transfer 
transformation grant in addition to the um, project AWARE, will they be awarded jointly or will any of those be separated out? I think first we'll be looking at awarding jointly, and then we'll see how many more applications fall within the funding range. I think it's certainly a possibility that there might be some singly funded, but we're going to first be looking to see where both applications scored high. Okay, and the second question is, I am not finding the details yet for the School Climate Transformation Grant. Just okay. wondering when those will be on the website for full download. Okay. And also, given that these need to be done jointly, the school transformation, um, they've extended that to June 30th uh, application deadline. I'm just wondering if the Project AWARE will be extended to June 30th since they are complementary grant applications. Okay. Um, let me see if I remember your question. First, on the due date, um, our application is due uh, June 16th, and I believe, and Carissa can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I believe the application due date for the Ed Grant is June 23rd, not the 30th. Um, SAMHSA does not plan and cannot plan to extend the deadline um, because we wouldn't be able then to review the applications in time to make the award. So I don't think you can expect that the application is going to be extended. We have been, this, this RFA has been on the street since April 15th, so it's been out there for a while. The um, Ed School Climate Transformation, both for the SEA and LEA, were released last week, um, and Krista will tell you where they can be found. I know I found them on the grant page at ed.gov. So um, if, you can't, if you can't locate them in grants.gov, I would suggest going to the Department of Education website, and you should be able to access it there. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Our next question is from Dennis Kaplan from South Bend, Indiana. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi. Um, when you say um, mental health authority, do you mean like a community mental health center, or can it be another community-based mental health service provider? Um, it, it, it certainly can be a community-based mental health service provider. I, I would, first, it does need to be nonprofit, um, and okay. it can be somebody that the that the state mental health agency would recognize as a um, uh, legitimate provider of mental health services. Okay. Question? Kind of. Okay. Um, I mean, if they're licensed and everything, that would be uh, a recognition, right? Yeah. If they're licensed to do business or have uh, get state money and stir, you know, for their services, that should be good enough, right? Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't have to be the community mental health center. I think the preference would be that I mean there's nothing in the in the in the application that says that it has to be that. I think the preference would be that because you want to be able to make sure that you can link um, these kids to services should a problem be identified. Right. So you know, and there's also nothing saying that you can't ha you can't have more than one mental health partner. Oh, that was my yeah. That was my next question. Okay. Okay. So you can certainly, if, if you have multiple multiple mental health agencies within your community, including your community mental health, and I don't think there's anything that says that you cannot partner with all of them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Our next question is from Trisha Harrity from Waterbury, Connecticut. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi, this is Trisha. Thanks for taking my question. I have two. The first one, I'm thinking about the six. Um, instructors who are to be trained, is it permissible that the, do all the instructors have to be employees of the LEA or could they be spread across some of the partner organizations as well? Okay, there's no requirement that they be um, all within the LEA, so it's up to you to decide who is going to be trained as the instructor Okay, and where, and and where they're located. Okay, good. Thank you. My other question is regarding the program coordinator. In the guidance, it's mentioned that you need to have a coordinator for the program, and it just says FTE. And I don't know if you could give any more guidance on how much of an FTE you think that program coordinator should be funded at. I think we left it up to you to determine um, what percentage. So rather than us saying it needs to be a minimum of 
you know, one FTE or two FTEs, we're going to leave it up to you. I mean, that's really part of as you're developing your training plan and your budget, you know, how much do you, do you think you're going to need of a coordinator? You're going to need somebody to coordinate it, but the FTE amount you would, you would need to determine. And as far as the program coordinator, again, the, the question of, uh, regarding where that person actually resides, I, I'm assuming it doesn't have to be an employee of the school. It could be an employee of the partner mental health agency. You're right. It, it does not have to be a school district um, person. However, just remember, though, that the applicant is the local education agency or school district, so they're mm -hmm. ultimately responsible for making sure that the requirements of the grant are met. So I think if it is a contracted position, there's going to have to be a clear understanding between the school district and that person about who they report to and who they are, are responsible to, because ultimately it's the, it's the school district. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Our next question is from Maria from Miami, Florida. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. I have a couple of questions, and even after listening to a, um, certain people that sort of stated the questions, I, I still have questions. Um, my first question is, those six people that are going to be trained, I, from the last young lady that spoke, I believe that they can um, be from the school district, or do they have to be from different organizations, or should it be a a group of the school district plus different organizations. Um, we don't say who they need to who they need to be. It's really up to you. They can all be from the school district. They could be, you know, one could be from the school district and one could be from law enforcement and the rest from mental health. Um, it's up to you to decide who you think the best persons are and the best agencies are to um, to have as, as being being people that are provide are people that are becoming instructors. So there's no, we don't say where, where they need to come from. We just say that you need to train at least six to be instructors. Okay. Once you train those six people, which could be in different from different organizations or so on, then they have to train 250 more additional people. Now, those additional people, they come from where? Would they only be teachers? Could they only be counselors? Or do they have to be an array of different people from all these partners? Um, I believe the RFA says it needs to be that you need to train school personnel and other adults to interact with youth. With youth, okay. The mental health first aider. So when we give some examples, we don't say it has to be this group of people, but we do give examples of who the adults might be who interact with youth. Okay, and another question. Could Do I have to do both an MF, MHFA and a YMFA? Or can I do only one? Um, you don't have to do both. Um, the reason we put we, the couple of reasons why we put both in one, um, Congress when they appropriated the funds for this, they appropriated for mental health first aid, so we had to put mental health first aid in there. However, I'd encourage you to take a look at the difference in programs. Mental health right. first aid is largely for um, is intended to detect uh, behavioral health issues in. Um, individuals over the age of 18, um, and your school district might have a sizable percentage of students who are older than 18, so you might want to you might want to do mental health first aid. Whereas youth mental health first aid is really intended to detect um, behavioral health issues in, in adolescents between the ages of 12 to 18. So it's your choice um, based on your population and your need to determine which of the two programs or if you need to do both of the programs. Okay. Uh, thank you. I still have another question. Um, can I notice that you can, uh, that you're stating that we should do the climate as well as the AWARE, the both yes. of the grants? Could yes. you utilize funds from um, the school climate to enhance or assist AWARE? Not really. You have to be. You have to be really careful. You might be. Um, I'm trying to think of the word. You, you might. You could not use the Department of Ed funds to augment to train more people in mental health. Okay. Today. Got it. But we would hope that that you're you're coordinating your mental health first aid or youth mental health first aid training efforts 
with what's happening in your school to climate transformation grant. Okay. You, you couldn't take some of the ed funds and say, oh, I need another $10,000 to, to do mental health first aid training. You can't do that. But you definitely are expected and, and are, it's hoped and expected that you're going to coordinate the activities. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Ms. Bouchard, we have three more callers in the queue. Okay. All right. Our, our next caller is Rosemary Walker from San Antonio, Texas. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, I have two really short questions. Uh, you mentioned that a copy of this presentation will be available. It will be on the um, uh, the SAMHSA site? Um, not initially. What, I was going to address it at the very end, but I can tell you now as well as the very end. What I would suggest is we're not going to be able to post it to the SAMHSA website until we are sure that the, the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation is 508 compliant, so there will be a delay in that. So what you can do is if you want a copy of the presentation is to send an email to the LEA underscore aware at SAMHSA.hhs.gov email box, and then we will send you, once we get the presentation, we will send it to you at that email address. Okay, wonderful. My other question was, um, when do you anticipate that the Department of Justice will release their grant? Um, Janet will tell you in hopefully in about 15 minutes. So just okay. Hold on to your seat. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Our next question is from Mackenzie Harrington Baycoat from Laconia, New Hampshire. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi. We are wondering if it is permissible to include in the budget stipends for school staff such as cafeteria workers, um, bus drivers, um, if we wanted to do one of the trainings on the Saturday, as an example, so it wouldn't really affect their daily work. Um, and whether and we see in there that you can put stipends for substitute teachers for your teaching staff, but what about the other school staff? Is, is it permissible to use money for that as well? Yes, you can. We just put it, we just wanted to give an estimated cost if you were doing the substitute teachers. But no, you absolutely can budget for um, stipends for other school staff. Okay, and then my last question is can we also include budgeted stipends for the instructors, such as, you know, say we have um, someone from our mental health who is trained as an instructor and maybe they're doing one of the trainings on a Saturday, can we also build in a stipend to compensate them for their time? You could. Um, but just remember that in order to, re to um, maintain their certification, they must do at least three trainings per year. So that's part of the requirements. So just um, you could certainly include a stipend that would that would be considered part of the training cost. Mm -hmm. and they have they have to do three trainings a year to maintain their right. certification. Yeah, we we saw that on there. We just didn't know if that would also be permissible. Do you feel as if that should be discouraged, though? I can't say. I think it's okay. okay. That's okay. And then um, one final question also was around the Appendix H, the, the estimated cost. The estimated cost per person per training is, I think, 50 to $150. What is that including beyond just, obviously, there's another line item for materials that you have there, but is that estimated amount for facilities for the training, things of that nature? What is what is that intended for? It could be facilities. It could be light refreshments. It could be what you just talked about is perhaps um, providing a small amount or a minimum amount of compensation to the instructor. Um, it's it's kind of a hodgepodge of costs. So we just said we think on an average it's, it, it could be between 50 and 150. Quite frankly, it might even be zero. I mean, if the if the – Yep. If the um, – Training rooms are, are free and, and somebody's donating the food. It really it could go down as low as, as no cost. The only thing you're, you're mandated to um, pay for, you are required to purchase a uh, manual for each of the first aiders, and that's $20. Okay, great, because we also had it, and our thinking was also that we could probably find free facilities. And then I swear this is my last question. You mentioned light refreshments. Are we allowed to include – the cost of food for an for an all-day training, whether it's coffee and or sandwiches for lunch, yeah. I know there's a lot of federal restrictions around your ability to utilize funding for that. Yeah. Appendix 
um, I'll tell you in a minute, I'm getting there. I'm get, there's um, one of the appendices talks about Appendix D, talks for SAMHSA grants, talks about funding instructions, funding restrictions, excuse me. Okay. I would take a look at that. It does say that, that in general meals are not allowable unless they're an integral part of a conference um, or specifically stated as an allowable expense in the RFA. Which, and we didn't put that in the RFA, so it would have to be the integral part of the meeting, and, but that grant funds could be used for light snacks not to exceed $2.50 per person. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yep. Our final question is from Sharon Bearden from Quincy, Illinois. Your line is open. You may ask your question. I, I have one last question. Um, is there a minimum population or enrollment requirement for the applying um, LEA? No. Which does bring up something, though, that I'm, I wanted to mention earlier when we talked about having to train at least 250 adults to become mental health first aiders. I have been getting calls from some communities that said because of their size, that would be very difficult. So, which we did not, we quite frankly, didn't think of when we were writing the RSA. So for them, I've been saying to, to identify the number of persons that could be trained as mental health um, first aiders that would be representative of the community and explain that in the RSA. And then for the peer reviewers, we will be amending the evaluation, the review criteria to let them know that we've instructed um, grantees with very small populations that we've allowed them to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. There are no other questions in the queue at this time. Okay, great. We can always open it up for questions about AWARE later on, but I really want to um, move on to um, the Department of Ed School Climate Transformation presentation, and Chris, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, hi, my name is Carissa Schaefer. I'm from the Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students, and I'll just be talking through the School Climate Transformation Grant for local educational agencies. We do have a program for SEAs, and both programs, um, you can see information that was posted to the Federal Register on May 7th for both programs. So I'll talk through briefly um, the purpose of um, school climate transformation. I'll identify the absolute and competitive priorities, um, briefly talk through program requirements, performance measures, the submission deadline, and give you all some contact info for more questions. All right, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so, School Climate Transformation grants, they were established as part of the Now is the Time initiative that Michelle talked through and as part of this comprehensive effort to support and address the full range of students' social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Next slide. So um, this program, you know, as Michelle sort of talked about already, was really developed in collaboration with uh, Health and Human Services as well as Justice. Next slide. All right, so the purpose of the School Climate Transformation Grant for local educational agencies is to develop, enhance, or expand systems of support for and technical assistance to schools implementing an evidence-based multi-tiered behavioral framework. So what is a multi-tiered behavioral framework? Uh, this is something we defined in the notice inviting applications. It's also defined in our application package, but basically it's, um, it's a school-wide structure used to improve the integration and implementation of behavioral practices, data-driven decision-making systems, professional development and opportunities, supportive policies, and evidence-based instructional strategies. So that's basically what we're talking about. Um, so for our program, there are, there's one absolute priority and two competitive preference priorities. So I recommend that you thoroughly read through the notice inviting applicants in our application package for the details. I'm just going to briefly touch on them here. But basically, the absolute priority is um, for LEAs to develop, enhance, or expand systems of support for or TA to schools um, within an LEA that are implementing these multi-tiered behavioral frameworks. So like I said, there's a lot more info in our application package. Our competitive, one of our competitive preference priorities is um, offers applicants the possibility to earn up to five additional points for their collaboration with other related uh, funding sources. So, for example, that could include um, 
activities associated with the Mental Health First Aid Program funded by SAMHSA, which we just learned about. The other competitive preference priority is five points for being a federally designated promise zone. And we've got a link if you're not sure what that program is or if your LEA is one, we have a link in our package you can click that shows a list of the promise neighborhoods. All right, next slide. Um, so we have over $23.5 million to award or anticipating about 118 grantees and as was mentioned earlier in the presentation um, we're expect you know you plan for up to 60 months for the grant um, next slide thank you all right so the notice inviting applications as well as the application package they define um, the program as well as application requirements and so definitely uh, look through those to make sure you're understanding what the requirements are but basically um, these are the program requirements that we're expecting in the projects so items one and two are things I sort of hit on already around the multi-tiered behavioral framework and technical assistance Something to take note of is the positive behavioral intervention supports. We have um, some directions to their site. It's a department-funded um, site that offers you some additional information. They'll be providing, um, you can look to resources like that for technical assistance. Um, and then just a couple other program requirements listed here. Next slide. So annually grantees upon um, award, they'll be reporting these for performance measures. Um, I think we actually have two slides. Can you, um, next slide. So performance or project and program performance measures are exactly the same. So you'll just be reporting on these in your annual performance reports. Next slide, please. Um, so I think there was a question about this earlier. Um, I'm not sure where the June 30 date is coming from, but the deadline is June 23rd, 2014 at 4.30 Washington, D.C. time. Um, you know, pretty standard directions around if you want to request a waiver for an electronic submission, um, check out our application package. But we do recommend that you uh, get your applications in earlier rather than later. We noticed that over the weekend, not on the 23rd, but over the weekend, there's a potential for um, one of our systems, the G5 system, to be having some maintenance. So um, just putting that out there to not wait to the last minute on uploading applications. And next slide. And so here's the program uh, website at the department's departmented.gov site. That's where you should see all the program information. Um, I believe there was a question earlier about where to access the application package and notice and information. Uh, you can go to grants.gov also and just do a quick search school climate. Uh, it'll come up. You can click and access that information. If you do have any specific questions, please do email us at the email address listed here, the LEA that um, SG, or SCTG at ed.gov, or um, give us a call. You know, leave your name and ask us your specific question, and we'll get back to you as you know as soon as we possibly can. I think email seems to be a little bit easier. We can respond to those a bit quicker. So. Hey, Keandra, this is Michelle again. We can open for questions again. Okay, thank you very much. As a reminder, if you have a question, please press star 1, and when you're prompted, give your first and last name as well as your location, city and state. One moment, please. Hey, bear with me one moment, please. All right, our first question is from Diane Tremblay from Hayward, Wisconsin. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, promise zones. Been doing some investigating. Went on the link. How 
I know what the first five were, but how do we know for a promise zone? And number two, for the climate grant, I, I see that you can pick any multi-tiered behavioral system, but it requires that you go to the PBIS um, leadership program. So I'm wondering, because we are use, we want to get trained in comp K-12 in our district, but I don't want to a apply for the grant using that behavioral model if PBIS is has a higher preference. And then my last question, I'm sorry, is actually on, a, on Appendix F for Project AWARE. It shows a sample budget. And I was under the understanding Project Aware is only 50000 each year for two years. And so I'm really confused by the sample budget in Appendix F. That's it. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll tackle your first two, and then I'll hand, um, I'll hand it back over to Michelle to answer that last question. Um, so the Promise Neighborhoods, those, I believe there are only five or six. Um, but if you if you did find that link um, that we have in our FAQs that takes you to the list of Promise Neighborhoods, um, that is it. It really isn't um, very many. But if you want to shoot me your um, LEA in an email, I can just double check for you real quick. Um, your other question was, oh, um, so PBIS, it's sort of, um, it's a department funded, you know, support. It's not a requirement. It's really not a specific curriculum at all. It's sort of an, um, open, way of sort of making sense of kind of this evidence-based multi-tiered behavioral framework. So whatever, you know, evidence-based framework you're using and want to use, you're not required to um, sort of follow any particular elements outlined in PBIS. It's solely there as a, a resource. So it won't be a competitive deduction if we weren't, if we didn't go with that model? No, there, um, no, so also take a look at the selection criteria in the application package. You'll see there that, um, it's not an element in which reviewers will be using to evaluate projects. Okay, and then the promise zone piece means that you just have preference if you're in that zone. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, that's right. Oh. All right, thank you. Okay, and this is Michelle again in response to the question about the appendix. It is just a sample budget. We don't do a a different sample budget for each RFA. The, the point is to provide you of, of the detail that's needed. So it's not just identifying um, the cost, but making sure there's, a, there's enough of a breakdown and a description so we, we understand how the costs are being um, allocated and expended. Okay. It's just, it's just an example. Okay, and then the 4,000 per instructor for the YMHFA estimate, you said that has to happen three times a year for all six instructors each year. So is that 4,000 times three times two? No. Um, the estimated cost to train an instructor is we put between $3,000 and $4,000. That is a one-time, it's a five-day training consecutively five days, and that's the estimated cost. It depends on... Um, whether you're going to have to travel somebody to the training or if the training is going to come to you. Obviously, it comes to you. It's probably going to be less rather than if they have to travel. Um, but there's no what, – what they are required to do, however, to maintain their – I think this is where you got confused – to maintain their instructor certification, they must teach at least three classes per year. But – don't, they don't have to be retrained to be an instructor. They must they must conduct at least three training classes per year to to maintain their instructor certification. Okay, so we should work that into the budget, whatever the cost of that is, to train those 250 people, divided up maybe three times during the course of the year. Is that the idea? Um, more or less. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Maria Flanagan from New York. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question has to do with coordination of the grant activities with other related projects, um, kind of referring to competitive preference, priority one. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if uh, the U.S. Education Department's elementary and secondary school counseling grant program is one that we should discuss in that section. We've applied for it, but we don't yet know if we got the grant. 
Um, and there's certainly some crossover between um, some activities. For example, we had proposed implementing an anti-bullying program um, and, and doing a school climate inventory. So I, I'm kind of trying to figure out how to um, avoid the supplement not supplant trap <laughs> by requesting some of the same things through the school climate transformation grant that I did through the counseling grant, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to not request those because of the you know, low likelihood that we would, in fact, get both grants. Mm -hmm. I hear you. So in the competitive preference priority, we're asking you to think, uh, we list out some examples of possible alternative funding streams that could support your uh, multi-tiered behavioral framework. So um, if you have other, you know, we've already seen some questions about state funding or other county funds that are coming in. So just think about, you know, what other uh, resources are out there that could enhance your overall impact of the multi-tiered behavioral framework so it's not limited to the um, what we have listed. So the other thing, um, as if this is stated in the notice as well, which is, you know, including your plan, you have to think about um, the event that you do not receive funding and sort of address that in your plan. So, right, like you were mentioning, um, your elementary and secondary school counseling grant, which you're not sure at this point if you'll receive funds. So that could be an example of, of um, coordinating resources, but then just um, think about that next step about in the event that you don't actually receive those funds. Does that answer your question? I, I think so. So I guess it would be okay to discuss that as a potential way that we might um, supplement this this grant, but we wouldn't necessarily have to because we don't have the grant yet. Exactly. You have to present a credible, high-quality plan, and then sort of what kind of, you know, sort of your plan be, like how, what are you going to do in the event that you don't receive the funds that you're sort of planning on receiving? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, I, I guess sort of as a follow-up question, would things like an anti-bullying program or character education or conflict resolution, are those the sort of programs that you mean when you talk about a suite of programs to address school climate issues? Yeah, so what you'll have to present is really um, how that sort of enhances the overall impact of your multi-tiered behavioral framework. So that's sort of the framing under which you're describing the coordination of your resources. So those would be allowable activities as far as the use of funding for a school climate transformation grant, though? Um, allowable use of funds. Could, could you follow up with an email listing specifics? I feel like um, generally speaking, yes, but I'm nervous about getting into too much like of particular programs. And right, yeah. I mean, I was just talking in general terms. But, yes, I'll, I'll send you an email. Okay. Um, Thank you. What is your address? It's the lea.sctg, School Climate Transformation Grant, ed. Gov. It's up on the screen right now. Oh, okay. I was having trouble accessing the video. I'm on a Mac, so I don't know. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yep, lea.sctg at ed.gov. Okay, thanks very much. All right, we have three more callers in the queue. Next caller is Maria from Miami, Florida. Your line is open. You may ask a question. Uh, I believe that there was a young lady who answered it. Uh, we are not to uh, utilize, or we it's a preference if we utilize the PBIS um, as a as a program, correct? Yeah, it's not worth additional points. It's just sort of listed as an example. As an example, but we could utilize something else that presently we're using in the school system. Yep. An it's RTI evidence. system, for example. Mm -hmm. An evidence-based multi-tiered framework. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that would be fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, it another. Have to be PBIS. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Another question that I have for you, um, based on the other question that the other lady that just finished asked. Um, we did apply also for the counseling grant. Now, can we, um, hmm, let me see, oh, how could I phrase this? Could we um, apply for this grant not thinking that we are going to get the counseling grant? 
Uh, I'm not sure that I understand your question. So you're asking... Well, we don't know if we're going to get the counseling grant or not. So the question would be, could we uh, tailor this grant to, of course, the requirements that you presently have, but there might be some similarities between this one and the uh, school counseling. Um, right. So I think what the, what you're getting at is sort of that point I was um, just bringing up is sort of the competitive priorities around developing a credible, high-quality plan. And we acknowledge that, you know, you, you may not know um, whether or not you're – say, for example, receiving all these funds, and that's why there's sort of that point to describe how in the event that, you know, or the extent that you do not receive the funding, um, sort of how you would adjust your proposed coordination strategies. Okay. All right. And another question, um, will, okay, the LEA who, who writes um, the, the school climate, um, would they also be awarded? Maybe or maybe not the aware. Uh, Michelle, do you want to take that one? Right, Marie. If I understand correctly, so if you if you are awarded school climate, would you automatically be awarded aware funding? Is that the question? Correct. Yes. You would have to score high in both competitions. Okay, but would it be possible to get the school climate and not the aware? Probably not. Probably not. So if you don't do well in both, you don't get it. I'm, I'm hesitating because <laughs> in, right now I think that's correct, but we, since we haven't, we haven't seen, nobody submitted applications, so we don't know how many applications we're going to get. We would assume that we're going to get the same number of aware applications as Ed gets for school climate. That not, might not that might not be the case. So I'm I'm going to I'm, I'm not sure I can honest I can, honestly I don't think I can definitively answer the question. I think the expectation is that those that are awarded school climate transformation grants would cert, could be awarded. Uh, would also be awarded aware funding as long as the scores are within a competitive range. Um, but that's all I can. That's all I know right now. Okay, but there wouldn't be a possibility to get the school climate without the aware. I don't believe so. You don't believe so? Okay, correct. Okay, got it. So it's just going to be a luck of the draw. <laughs> Well, no, not look at a draw. I mean, you would have to, you would have to, still, you would have to develop two good applications. Which exactly, exactly. Anyway, yeah. you would have to do that in order to uh, be up there with the scores. Okay, right. that sounds interesting. All you, right. You would always submit an excellent application anyway, right? No, no, definitely. I was just, you know, because some, maybe if you did one and you scored high, and then in aware you would score a little lower than. You know, maybe you could get one, but not the other. But in this case, they both go hand in hand. We will, we are we will definitely be taking a look to see the matchup, um, and to the extent possible, be awarding aware funds to those who scored high in the Ed School Climate Transformation. So, to the extent possible, we're looking at doing the match. Okay, got it. All right, thank you. All right. We have two more callers in the queue. Our next question is from Julianne Vachon from Shepherdsville, Kentucky. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi. Uh, my question was about um, are we allowed to use funding to hire um, counselors or other type of mental health professionals to provide the actual Tier 2 level supports or Tier 2 or Tier 3 level supports? Um, yeah, so we have, this is actually one of our FAQs in the application package number 48, so uh, which asks can you use um, school climate transformation grant funds for direct services, and the answer is yes, um, so long as all these activities should be related to the developing of the LEA capacity to adopt, implement, and sustain the practices, personnel, and system supports um, to implement the expand to implement and expand the multi-tiered behavioral frameworks. 
Okay, I also had a, pro a question about Project Aware. Um, going back to that full-time equivalent project director, um, or maybe I was just reading it wrong. As I read it, it said that you needed to have a full-time equivalent. So somebody working sounded to me like year-round on this as a project director. But when I looked at the $50,000 budget, that just seems like you'd have to use somebody you already have on staff. You couldn't pay somebody to do that job with a limited amount of funding. Am I just understanding that wrong? Yeah, you are. Um, in the SEA, Project Aware for State Education Agencies, there is a requirement that you have a full FTE as the coordinator for the mental health first aid, youth mental health first aid training. For the LEA Aware, which is what we're talking about today, we don't, we don't say what percentage of an FTE there is. So there's nothing in there that says you need to have one. We know you know, we know that, that there's no way you have enough funds to have a full-time person, but it's going to be up to you to decide what percentage of an FT you're going to have to coordinate this. All righty. Thanks. Our next question is from Ch Tracy Knutson from Conyers. Sorry, one moment. Tracy Knutson from Conyers, Georgia. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Thanks. My question is from Michelle. Um, I'd just like to get a little clarification on the requirement to collect data, not on the GIPRA, but on the number of school-age youth that interface with trained adults. Um, we're not clear on the what you mean by interface and how maybe duplicate encounters are handled or things like that. What, what we would be looking for is we would be making the assumption that the number of school-aged youth would be your school enrollment. Uh huh. So what we would do is whoever is awarded, we would be looking at you providing um, the number of students that you have enrolled in your school. So it's not like a tracking mechanism that we need to find. No. no okay. It's not that specific. Right. So you would have to develop some tracking mechanisms for the three GIPRA measures. Right, exactly. But not anything that our trained people would have to go in and update every time they interact with the with no, a student. No, 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 no. Okay. No. <laughs> That's a relief. Yeah, that would be a little onerous. Yes, it would. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Keandra, if there are no more questions, or maybe we should just go on to the Department of Justice. We'll open it up again so if people have questions either about the justice program and or um, the school climate transformation or where we'll open it up again. So, um, Janet, I'm going to leave it to you. Right up on the screen right now is your, your cover page that says with the White House. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, um, my presentation will be a little bit different. Our um, solicitation is not yet on the street. It should be very soon, however. So I'm going to talk probably a little bit more generally uh, than the other speakers have about the program, but um, hopefully give you some sense of what is coming down the road um, and how it interfaces with the other two programs that were discussed. Uh, so this is the um, Department of Justice's piece of this larger initiative. Um, we are calling this the School Justice Collaboration Program, Keeping Kids in School and Out of Court. Um, uh, if you can move the page, Michelle, sorry. Um, We're on your first slide. Okay, first slide, thank you. So um, this is an additional complimentary grant program that goes with the net. Now is the time funding stream that is supporting the other two initiatives within here. Um, there's a, some difference between the two initiatives, uh, sorry, the two, those two and ours, in that um, the focus here is more on the juvenile justice system uh, rather than on the law of the uh, local education agencies, although we are still fo focused at the local level. So the purpose is to really support this collaboration between courts, law enforcement, and schools, obviously, to improve school climate and respond early to the student behavioral and mental health needs. Uh, my office is the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and we're administering this grant, which again is a little bit different than the other two, but is complementary. So next slide. Uh, there are two, there will be, sorry, two categories with the, this solicitation uh, once it gets released. 
Um, the first will be grants that will be going to local juvenile and family courts. So this is one area in how we are different. Uh, rather than going to local education agencies, they will be going to what essentially is the juvenile justice agency within that community. Uh, we are looking uh, to make up to four awards um, for up to $600,000 each for a three-year period. The um, appropriation that provided us with these funds is requiring that award, these four awards will go to the same jurisdictions as, as four um, jurisdictions that are receiving the education uh, school climate transformation grants, and we are also looking to um, provide to uh, provide funds to communities that are obviously also getting project aware funds. Uh, so we will be looking at both of these things in our review, and we are working closely with both the Department of Education and SAMHSA um, at the at the point of decisions. Um, another component of these awards is that um, because law enforcement is a big piece of this. Uh, work and particularly that early intervention piece, those grantees that are selected at the local level will be required to subgrant with their local law enforcement agency. Um, so that will be part of the application um, package. Once it's released, um, you will, you'll see some information about that in there. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I said, there are two categories uh, to this program. So one is these local program grants, and then the other is selecting a, a national training and technical assistance provider who will focus on uh, this relationship between schools and juvenile justice, in particular in supporting early intervention and focusing on diversion programs um, rather than bringing kids further into the juvenile justice system, when it, particularly when it comes to me mental health and behavioral uh, needs. Uh, so we will also be making an award uh, for up to $2 million for, again, a uh, multi-year project period to a one organization who will serve as that training and technical assistance provider who will be working with the other, the other training and technical assistance providers that will be part of this larger initiative uh, to help with the implementation and sustainability of programs as well as developing tools, training, resources that would be used for more than just those localities that are, are receiving funding uh, through these initiatives. Um, last slide or next slide. Uh, our plan is to release the solicitation within the next week, hopefully as soon as Monday. Uh, it will be posted for a minimum of 30 days. Um, again, we're kind of late in the process, so we are hoping to have it out there a little bit longer than that, <laughs> but it, we will be pretty much in line with education and uh, SAMHSA's uh, project, or sorry, um, deadline <laughs> uh, for solicitations. So um, you will be applying also through grants.gov as you are with the other initiatives. Um, one way to get immediate notification in addition to um, Obviously, we will be releasing this information through all three agency listservs and, you know, different communication methods. But, uh, w you know, one thing you may want to do is just go ahead and go on the OJJDP website um, and uh, sign up for our listserv, which will also ensure that you get notification as soon as it comes out. And um, I think that's about it that I have at this point, but I'm happy to field any questions. In a calendar, we can open up the lines again. Sorry, my line was closed. Diane from Louisville, Kentucky. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Okay, thank you. I have a, a couple questions. Going back to Project AWARE, can an LEA be part of a state Project AWARE application and then also apply for the school climate transformation grant as an LEA? Would that qualify them? Let me see if I understand your question. So the LEA is part of the project aware for the state education agency. Yes, be part of that application. And then could the LEA also apply for the LEA school climate transformation? Right. 
Yes, but they would also, that LEA would also have to apply for the project aware LEA. Okay, so we couldn't be a part of the state when we would need to have a separate application. So you could be, no, you, you can be part of, if, you can be part of the state and if you, right. but if you decide that you're also going to put in an application for the LEA, uh, that's okay. You just have to do both the, the both LEA programs. So, I mean, okay. you, you would have to, the state would have to do um, two applications also. So they would have to do an application for AWARE and an application for school climate transformation. Okay. Then you as an individual school district could, could apply for the local funds and you would have to put in the funds for the LEA, school climate transformation, as well as Project AWARE. Okay, so basically, I guess looking at it is, is that basically we need to either be a part of the state for both or do a separate for both. No, you can do both. Okay. It's a lot of work, but you can do both. Yeah. <laughs> but but if we want to do the the um, LEA for school transformation, we also will have to do an LEA for Project AWARE. Correct. Okay. And another question um, concerning the school transformation is on the RFA on page 49 and 50 on um, the score rubric, if you, under quality of services, under B, under uh, 3 and 4, which is on page 50, are exactly the same thing, both saying that they're worth 10 points. Yes, um, we are making that technical adjustment, and it should be reposted if it hasn't already yet today by the end of the day. Okay. And the deadline is the 23rd, not the 30th, because I've yes. seen it both ways. So it is the 23rd? It is the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, that's all I need to know then. Thank you. Oh, one other uh, question is, can we um, suggest in the um, school climate that we're going to hire a project director who, in turn, would also be the director for the project aware? Or would we need someone in-house already named for that project aware? Um, there's no um, requirements around that for us, whatever, you know, makes sense for your program. I don't know unless, okay. Michelle, if there's anything you need to add. Uh, project, you're talking about a coordinator for Project AWARE at the LEA level? Yes. Um, could, it, could, could we basically propose that same person would be doing project coordinator for both the transformation yeah. and for you Project know, AWARE or someone that we may hire from the outside? Okay. As for the first question, you could certainly, as long as their 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 total SEE allocation doesn't exceed one, so you might have a half of that person, let's say, on aware and a half on school climate transformation. Uh huh. You couldn't have a full time person certainly doing school climate and then also use that person for aware. Okay. Um, but then the second part of your question was, I think, do you have to use somebody's authority within the school system? Is that what the question was? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is no, you do not. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Our next question is from Lori Scott from Champaign, Illinois. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi, thanks. Um, I've got a couple questions. Well, one question about Project AWARE. The youth... Um, program, I noted that it said um, youth age 12 to 18, so we were initially thinking about K, maybe not K, but the elementary school, so is it my understanding that that Project AWARE is inappropriate, or I'm sorry, the youth mental health first aid is inappropriate for anyone under the age of 12? No, I don't think it's inappropriate, but it's really going to be focusing on those those behavioral health issues that arise largely when um, youth are entering adolescence. Okay. So I, I certainly think that the youth mental health first aid would probably help identify other issues with children younger than that, but it's really focused on, um, a large part of it's focused on issues that, or behavioral health issues that would arise as kids enter adolescence. Okay, so if we were proposing to do that at elementary schools, it may not be viewed as competitive, I guess, or in line with the purposes of that program. Yeah, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean by to do, do, to do the training. Well, if we were, well, um, 
there's a school and the community piece. So I guess if we were training school personnel on um, the youth mental first aid and we were saying we want to train, you know, first through fourth grade teachers, that may not make sense or be most beneficial. I'm, yeah, maybe I'm not being very clear. You Sorry. certainly have to make that decision. Um, okay. Well, I'll I'll check it out a little bit more. But, okay. Um, and then with the climate grant, um, I would assume that correct me if this is not right. Um, we would be look at we would uh, because our district is fairly large. Um, we would be identifying a select number of schools to participate as opposed to the entire district? Um, yeah, we don't have any require minimum number of schools or maximum number of schools. The only um, requirement that we have is that you, in your um, plan, address the needs of high-need schools. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. Some of them are more high-need than others. So, okay, great. And then um, with the technical assistance, um, whether it's PBIS or an, uh, or other, um, I mean, I see that as a, a significant, if not major, component of the grant and the grant budget. So, um, do you? I mean, would we just contact our PBIS um, folks at the state level to try to come up with what those budget numbers are? I'm fairly new to this um, position. Yeah. If you're planning on um, contracting with, you know, you just have to follow Edgar procurement um, regulations around contracting, you know, having open competitions and whatnot. Um, there's definitely more guidance around that in Edgar, and if you want more info, we can definitely email that out to you. But, um, yeah, that's just something, you know, you're going to have to take a look at, you know, your needs analysis and figure out what it is that you all need and what makes sense for you. Right, right. Well, and the RFA talks about um, the program um, providing technical assistance regarding a lot of different things, both some of its data gathering and systems, et cetera. Okay, I will look that through in a little bit more detail. Um, I think that's it for me right now. Thank you. Our next question is from Maria from Miami, Florida. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, my question would be for the DOJ School Justice. Um, mm -hmm. Would we have to also apply for this? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you mean do you also have to apply for the Justice Grant? Or? Right. Correct. Um, you're not required to apply for the Justice Grant, but if you do apply for the Justice Grant, you should be also applying for the School Transformation and Project AWARE grants. Okay, got it. All right. And I heard the, and I need some clarification again on the FTE. If uh, you can have a person, uh, a .5 on AWARE, and you can have also another .5 on the school climate? Yes, you could do that. And... The 0.5 for AWARE could be paid out of the school climate? No. That's what you could not do. You can't do that. Okay. No. So if, if you have 0.5 of an FTE that's dedicated to Project AWARE, the funding for that position has to be coming from AWARE funds. You cannot um, take funds from school climate transformation and put it into a, use it for AWARE purposes. Okay, so that FTE has to come from aware from the fifty thousand. Correct. Okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. And then the half or the full FTE for the climate has to come from the funds for the climate. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, um, our next question is from Maria Flanagan from New York. Your line is open. Ms. Flanagan? Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, I had my phone on mute. Problem. Um, 
Uh, you may have just addressed this question, but I wanted to make sure that um, the answer would be the same because it's a slightly different question. Um, regarding a project evaluator, if we were interested in using, I'm sorry, for the school climate transformation grant, if we were interested in using some of the funds to hire an independent outside evaluator, um, should we or should we not identify that organization in our application? It seems like it depends on which federal grant program. It says uh, that we should. Uh, so after award, you'll have to follow your district procurement policies and hold an open and fair um, bidding process for a, if it's an outside contractor, um, you know, it sounds like that's what you're describing, not in in-house, yeah. you know, sort of person. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, describe what they would be doing and what type of, you know, entity you'd be looking for, but then, yeah, you'll have to follow those um, Edgar procurement policies. That's what I had thought. On page 52, it says to identify the individual or organization, but we should not do that if it's going to be um, an independent. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I guess the only time you would do that is if you had an evaluation firm on retainer or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, we've gotten a number of questions on this, so exactly. Okay. All right, thank you very much. All right, we have two other callers in the queue. Our next question is from Lori Scott from Champaign, Illinois. Your line is open. You may ask your question. Okay. Uh, back again, I forgot one question, um, and this goes back to Project AWARE. Um, on page 9 of the RFA, um, the third bullet point down, it, it says something to the fact, based on the size of the community, the application, we are supposed to identify the number of additional youth serving Adults, i.e., more than the more more than the minimum 250 persons um, that will be trained, um, so that you know it, to effectively saturate the community. I guess how are we to determine how many more than the 250 we are supposed to train, if any? It says based on the size of the community, but it doesn't say anything beyond that. Yeah, I, we have to leave that up to you to determine. Um, I mean, we're saying okay. a minimum for, for, you know, but you might have, well, first of all, funding is probably going to limit you anyway. Um, right. But but to the extent that you can, if, if you have, I mean, it sounds like you have a very large community. So if it is very large, what other things could you do to, um, to, train more people to be mental health first aiders that might, you know, in order to increase the Okay. Numbers. So there's not a chart I can go to that says no. if your community is 100,000, you need to train 50 more or whatever. Right. No, okay. no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Sharon Bearden, I'm sorry, from Quincy, Illinois. Your line is open. I have a question regarding an LEA consortium. We have um, a very large school district and then four very small community unit districts and within the same county. And just wondering um, how best to do that. Do you have a lead LEA and then have letters of commitment? Or what would be the um, a best way to go about pulling that consortium together? Is, is, this is Michelle, is the, what you're proposing a consortia, is it this large school district, is it, an administ, is it an administrative unit that oversees the smaller school districts? No, it isn't. However, we have a special ed association that covers all of the districts. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to... You might want to send the question to me at the LEA underscore where at SAMHSA.hhs.gov or give me a call. My phone number is in the RFA so I can find out more information. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I, right off the top of my head, I'm not sure if you, based on what you're telling me right now, if you would meet the definition of a consortia of LEAs. So 
um, give me a call or send me an email and we could talk about it. Okay, and I have a question. This is for the Department of Justice. Um, this is regarding a separate grant application, which is what works to keep schools safe, which is a research grant, and just wondering if that is somehow connected with these. Uh, it is not connected. That is actually administered by the National Institute of Justice, um, and it's not it's not directly connected to these projects. No. Okay. Thanks. All right. Our last question in the queue at this time is from Diane from Louisville, Kentucky. Your line is open. Hello again. I had um, a question about the school climate grant uh, performance measures and looking at those we're a larger school district but looking to target some specific interventions um, with a, a particular number of schools when we look at performance measures does that need to be across the district or does that just need to be at the targeted schools uh, so you'll be reporting on those schools that are participating in the project okay okay thank you that's all I have all right. There are no other questions. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Um, Mackenzie Baycoat, your line is open. You may ask your question. Hi. I, we just wanted to clarify a question that we heard about the school transformation grant regarding the requirement to go out to RFP if you want to utilize an outside entity and organization within your state, as an example, to come in and do, um, let's say, PBIS coaching and training to help get your internal staff up and running. Is that correct? Or, or can we build them into the grant itself when we write it? Um, so if you're going to be, be doing any contracting, um, you're going to have to follow, you know, the open and fair procurement practices. If you're going to be implementing, you know, professional development through the trainers and folks that you already are paying through your personnel, um, then, you know, you can go ahead and do that. And you can write in, you know, either approach, but just in terms of naming particular contractors in the application, you can't do that. Okay. Thank you. Deandra, there, any other questions? Um, there are no other questions in the queue at this time. Okay, we'll give it about 15 seconds, and if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and close. And I'll remind people of what they need to do in order if they want to get a copy of the webinar. Okay, calendar, if there's no questions. Um, there are no questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to finish up. Again, if you, as I said earlier, if you would like a copy of the recorded webinar, please send me your email to lea underscore aware at samsa.hhs.gov, and I will forward it to you as soon as I receive it. I usually get it within about, with, usually within 24 hours. And that's it, Keandra. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. Participants, you may disconnect at this time. One moment, please. Okay.